We are on a series focusing on the Sermon on the Mount, and boy, do we need the grace of God for what we're going to hear about today. We're going to talk about turning the other cheek. What does it mean to turn the other cheek? And so the word of the Lord says this, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 38, Jesus says, you have heard it said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you. Do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. It says next, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you only greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I'm going to focus on those, the text in yellow in the first slide there. It says, to turn the other cheek. And then here it says, he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. I'm going to, many layers here. This is a good message for New Yorkers. Uh, we need this message. And um, uh, there's so many levels here and layers here. I'm going to hope to unpack this for us so it all makes sense to us by the time we close our service. Let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to open our eyes today. Lord Jesus, we need your grace for a message like this. And so may the Holy Spirit uh, move powerfully in us. May there be a sense of openness and receptivity to your word. And Lord, may we do what you call us to do. We offer this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. Amen. A couple of months ago, I took my son Nathan to an indoor play area. And in this uh, play area, there was a train track model in one of the corners of the room. The only problem was there was no little train to go on the tracks, and Nathan loves trains. And so I told him, son, the next time we go to this area, we're going to take one of your trains, and we'll play with it. He was pleased to hear that. A couple of weeks later, we go back to the play place. Nathan says, I need to bring my train. I said, go get your train. He brings the train with him. We get to the play area, and he starts playing with this train on the tracks, and he's making the choo-choo sounds. He loves trains. He was playing by himself. There was one train there, his train, when another little boy came over. The little boy realized there's not another train and started looking at Nathan saying, give me your train. (laughs) Nathan looked at the little boy and said, no. (laughs) The little boy, who was a little bigger than Nathan, asked again, give me the train. Reaching for it, Nathan said, no. At that point, the little boy started getting a little aggressive. Nathan ran. He ran to the other side of the play area. The little boy ran after him. I went after him. Now, I'm in the distance watching this, and I'm going, this is little boy. Uh, what's going to happen here? Where's his mother? She's over there. I'm looking at the mother now. What are you going to do, miss? And, and the little boy says, give me the train. Nathan says, no. The little boy hits Nathan on the shoulder. Boom. And without a second going by, Nathan takes his train and knocks the kid upside the head. Boom! And I looked and said, that's my son. That's my son. That's my boy. I know a pastor shouldn't be confessing that, but... um, I said, that's my son. If you ever watched the end of The Karate Kid where Mr. Miyagi is just looking at Daniel and just... That was me in the distance. We live in what I would call a counter-punching world. And we live in a world where hitting back is not just expected, it is celebrated. A counter-punch is the immediate punch a boxer throws back at his opponent or her opponent. And in boxing, it makes sense. 
But counterpunching on a world level, an interpersonal level, is a recipe for disaster. And we've seen this throughout human history. We, whether it's in domestic disputes or neighborhood gang violence or political mudslinging or religious holy war or international war, we live in a counterpunching world, a tit for tat world, an eye for an eye world, which is why Gandhi would say in one of his more famous quotes, an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. <laughs> and so here we come to a very challenging and direct portion of Jesus' sermon. And it's clear, it's direct, it's hard. And preaching through the Sermon on the Mount reminds me of a famous Mark Twain quote where Mark Twain says these words. He says, it ain't the parts of the Bible that I understand, that I can't understand that bothers me. It's the parts that I do understand. And here Jesus is very clearly setting out a course of what it means to be his follower. And what Jesus is saying very simply in this portion of this uh, passage and of his sermon is what I want to just have us hold on to. And it's this big idea that we are to resist the powerful urge to retaliate. To resist the powerful urge to retaliate. And whether that retaliation comes in the words that we speak or the acts that we do or the passive aggressiveness that we hold... We are called to resist the powerful urge to retaliate. Now, when we are wronged, we are accustomed to living according to the world script. And the world script very simply is with revenge and retaliation, with vengeance and violence. And yet Jesus challenges the dominant script of our age and sets forth a radical and creative alternative. And so as I preach this, I want you to be thinking about the person you're having a hard time loving, about the person you want to counterpunch, about the person you want to retaliate against. And maybe it's an individual person, maybe it's a group of people, but I want you to hold it in your mind as I preach this. Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. Now that statement is quite a statement, and I've, we've been trying to say that throughout the course of this series. Because Jesus is saying, you have heard it said in the Bible, but I'm giving you something deeper. I'm giving you something that is to reflect the heart of God a little more truer. <clears throat> and the only one who can set a word aside and introduce a new word is God. And so when Jesus says this, what we're, what we're saying as Christians is Jesus is more than just a teacher saying this. He's more than just a prophet. This is the very presence of God, the Son of the living God, the living word himself, giving us a new word, a deeper word. He says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye. And this is one of the more well-known passages and yet one of the more misunderstood verses in all the Bible. And so to get at what Jesus is saying, you have to look at the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, because everything Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is related to what the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures said. He's, he's a man deeply immersed in the Scriptures. And to get this idea of what is Jesus saying with eye for an eye, you have to look at the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus 24, it says these words. This is where it first comes up. It says, Moses says, anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution. Life for life. Anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner. Fracture for fracture. Eye for eye. Tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. Whoever kills an animal must make restitution, but whoever kills a human being is to be put to death. You are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. I am the Lord, your God. Now, here's the image in Leviticus. Someone has knocked your tooth out, you take them to court, to the religious kind of court there. The judge looks at your missing tooth. The guy, judge says, did you punch his tooth out? He says, yes, but it was an accident. He goes, you know what, right now you get to punch his tooth out. Go ahead, punch his tooth out. Tooth for tooth. You go to the court and your eyes all busted up and you go, he busted my eye. Did you bust his eye? Oh, it was an accident. It doesn't matter. Right at this moment, you get to bust his eye. Your leg is fractured. Oh, you fractured my leg. You fractured his leg. You get to just fracture his leg right now. Eye for eye. Fracture for fracture. Tooth for tooth. Now, all this sounds a bit harsh, 
But when you look at the larger context around it, you get the heart and spirit behind this command. Because the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth principle was to help one another live, and here's the phrase, with controlled justice. Controlled justice. The law, this law, put into check the wild, uncontrolled vengeance and revenge that often fills our hearts. Now, prior to this law, it was possible that a slight injury to a person's mother could be avenged by killing many family members of that person. And so you push my mother, I'm killing you and your family. And so this law was to ensure that people don't go overboard. And if there's one thing that's for certain about human beings, we know how to go overboard. When we feel someone has wronged us, our natural impulse is to not just get even, it's to get even and then some. And so this law was to ensure that people don't go overboard. You're nasty with me, I'll be nasty with you. You insult me, I'll insult you. You hurt me, I'll hurt you. But the reality with us is is not that simple because in the moment, whenever there is a kind of emotion-driven retaliation, it usually overreacts because of pain. I might think I'm just trying to get even, but because it's emotion-driven retaliation, we lose control. This is the story of human history. This is the story of life on the playgrounds, story of our marriages, of in our churches. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you, and we take it to the next level. You insult me, I slap you. You slap me, I stab you. You stab me, I shoot you. You shoot me, I kill you. You kill my family, I kill your entire village. And all-out war breaks out. And so Moses says the punishment must fit the crime. And when you see it this way, you see that the commandment is fair, it's just, it's civilized, especially in that culture. Now, socially, Jesus is not saying to do away with justice when he says to turn the other cheek. On the contrary, the commandment is about justice and fairness. And so when he says to turn the other cheek, he's not saying do away with justice. If someone exploits another person, abuses a child, murders another person, Jesus is not saying turn the other cheek, forget about it, forgive them, let let them go. He's saying, no, no, God is a God of justice. And his justice is perfect. But his justice is so perfect that his justice and love don't contradict each other. They are held in dynamic tension together. And so when he says to turn the cheek, he's not doing away with the original commandment, but what this is what he's saying. He's saying, we can go deeper than that. And so when Jesus says, I tell you, he's not negating it, he's deepening it. And this is consistent with everything else Jesus said. Jesus would say earlier on, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, if anyone lusts in his heart, he's already committed adultery. He's not doing away with the commandment, he's deepening the commandment. When he says you shall not murder, he's not, but, but I tell you, if anyone is angry at his brother and his heart, he's already committed murder. He's not doing away with the previous commandment. He is deepening the commandment. When he says eye for an eye, he says turn the cheek. He is deepening the commandment. Now, before I go into what Jesus means by this, let me say what Jesus doesn't mean by this. What is Jesus not saying? Well, Jesus is not saying To turn the cheek means to let yourself remain in an abusive relationship. When Jesus says turn the other cheek, he's not saying let yourself be a punching bag. He's not saying let yourself be bullied. He's not saying that criminals would go free if they rob a Christian because Jesus just said to to turn the other cheek. What Jesus is saying is something so counter-instinctual and counter-cultural Let me say it this way, and I want to just lay out just three things Jesus is saying when he says to turn the other cheek. The first thing Jesus is saying is essentially this. Don't become the evil you are trying to resist. Don't become the evil you are trying to resist. One of the greatest temptations we all have is the temptation to become that which we hate. And this is the temptation for all of us, to become 
that which we hate. And so Jesus, in saying turn the other cheek, he's saying stop the cycle. It ends with you. That we know how to escalate. We know how to perpetuate. But he's saying it ends with you. And so he's saying, he's not saying be a punching bag, but neither is he saying punch them back. He's saying do not become the evil you're trying to resist. And we live in a culture that becomes the evil that we are trying to resist. What does it mean to say it stops right here? There's a story told of a a philosopher named Dallas Willard who taught at the University of Southern California. And one day as he's giving this class on philosophy, one of his students interrupts and begins to give his opinion on the matter in a very condescending way to the professor. And this professor is a Christian, a well-known author. And so the students are surprised that this one student would speak at the professor in this kind of condescending, rude way. And the students are waiting for the professor to just embarrass him in front of everyone else. To kind of just see, oh, the professor is going to really give it to this guy. And the professor, Dallas Willard, ends up saying, you know what, this is a good time to end the class. Let's dismiss. And the students were so puzzled and baffled by it. And one of the students came up to him and said, you could have killed him. You could have destroyed him. You're so much smarter than him. Why did you just dismiss the class? And Dallas Willard responded with this. He says, I'm practicing the spiritual discipline of not having the last word. Help us, Jesus. I'm practicing the spiritual discipline of not having the last word. We all want the last word. And that's all I got to say about that. Well, let me say something back. We all want the last word. But Jesus in saying, turn the other cheek, is saying, don't become the evil you are trying to resist. That's the first thing he's saying. The second thing about this passage is, is, is it's not about non-resistance, but creative resistance. And that's the second thing I want you to see here. That this is about creatively resisting a person who might have done harm to you. When you look at Jesus, Jesus resisted evil with every fiber in his being. He resisted it. But he doesn't resist it using the tools of the world. No one has helped me to see this more than a man named Walter Wink, a theologian. More than anyone, he's helped me to see how subversive and powerful the truth of this passage is to turn the other cheek. To turn the other cheek is not to be a punching bag, it's to creatively resist a person who might have done harm to you. I, I want to give a lengthy quote here. I need you to stay with me on this because the, the, the thinking behind this passage here uh, needs to be teased out a bit. And he gives kind of first century Jewish understanding. What is Jesus saying in that context here? I want you to just stay with me because I think this will make sense what it means to creatively resist a person. He says this, Walter Wink, when Jesus says, if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also, you are probably imagining a blow with the right fist. But such a blow would fall on the left cheek. To hit the right cheek with the fist would require the left hand. But the left hand could use, could be used only for unclean tasks. To grasp this, you must physically try it. How would you hit the other's right cheek with your right hand? If you have tried it, you will know the only feasible blow is a backhand. The backhand was not a blow to injure, but to insult, humiliate, degrade. It was not administered to an equal, but to an inferior. Masters backhanded slaves, husbands, wives, parents, children, Romans, Jews, The whole point of the blow was to force someone who was out of line back into place. He continues, notice Jesus' audience, if anyone strikes you. These are people used to being thus degraded. He is saying to them, refuse to accept this kind of treatment anymore. They backhand you, turn the other cheek. The left cheek now offers a perfect target for a blow with the right fist, but only equals fought with fists. 
as we know from Jewish sources. And the last thing the master wishes to do is to establish this underling's equality. This act of defiance renders the master incapable of asserting his dominance in this relationship. He can have the slave beaten, but he can no longer intimidate him. By turning the cheek, then, the inferior is saying, I am a human being just like you. I refuse to be humiliated any longer. I am your equal. I am a child of God. I won't take it anymore. He closes with this here. He says, such defiance is no way to avoid trouble. Meek acquiescence is what the master wants. Such turn-the-cheek behavior may call down a flogging or worse. But the point has been made. The powers that be have lost their power to make people submit. And when large numbers begin behaving thus and Jesus was addressing a crowd, you have a social revolution on your hands. Now, you know what this is? This is Rosa Parks refusing to sit in the back of the bus saying, you're not better than me. I'm not inferior to you. I'm made in the image of God. It's black men during the civil rights movement saying, I am a man to those who would call them boy and would try to oppress them. It's a woman looking at the man who would abuse her and saying, I am a woman made in the image of God and I won't take this anymore. You're not better than me. I have dignity. I'm made in the image of God. I'm turning the other cheek. This is not about being a punching bag, but neither is it about punching others. It's a creative resisting of those who would try to see you as inferior. And so to to turn the other cheek is is not just to, to, uh, about don't become the evil you're trying to resist. It's about creatively resisting a person who might have done harm to you. But I want to show you how Jesus connects this portion with the last portion that I read. What does it mean to turn the cheek? It means we are called to overreact with grace. Overreact with grace. The law says get justice, but don't overreact in anger. Jesus says look to give grace and overreact with grace. Surprise them by giving undeserved acts of love. You know why we need to say, Lord, I'm poor in spirit? Because in our own strength, we can't do this. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to do something like this. Jesus is saying, instead of returning insult with an insult, offer blessing. Instead of returning hatred for hatred, pray for them. Now, what's interesting and a bit discouraging about this, if I can confess, is The reason Jesus tells us to do this is not because it will always change another person. That's a bit discouraging to me. Jesus doesn't promise that if you do this, the other person will change. He doesn't promise if you do this, there will be reconciliation. He doesn't say if you do this, there will be transformation. Jesus doesn't promise any of that. But Jesus seems to be saying that our willingness to turn the cheek is what truly conquers evil. And so the reason we do this is not because it works. The reason we do it is because Jesus commanded us to. And Jesus then gives the ultimate reason why we are to do this. In verse 43, this is what he says. He says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that they may be your Uh, be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Why does Jesus overturn the notion of retaliation? It's very simple, actually. Jesus is revealing to us what God is like. Why why turn it on its head? Very simple. He's showing us what God is like. The Sermon on the Mount shows us how to be like God and shows us what God is like. 
This is why we are to come to church. Not just to get an encouraging word, but to be more like God. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Jesus shows us right in this passage here. He says, be perfect. The kind of the summary of it is be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, that word perfect is not the best translation, especially for our Western minds. When we think of perfection, we think of having no flaws. We think of no mistakes. We think of no errors. And that's more of a Greek way of understanding the word. But when Jesus says be perfect, it's really out of the Hebrew understanding of the word. And that word perfect means really at least two things. It means be mature as your heavenly father is mature or be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. And Jesus explains to us this idea of God's perfection by using a metaphor. He says, your heavenly father causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. And this is one of the more radical statements in the Bible. He says, God's mercy and compassion works like the sun. The sun is completely undiscriminatory. The sun doesn't discriminate. The sun doesn't say vegetables are good, but weeds are bad. God doesn't say, I'm going to pour warmth on vegetables and freeze out the weeds. The sun just shines. It goes out to the good and to the bad. And so Jesus is saying very radically that God's love is for everyone. He's saying God's love is for the Jews and the Romans. God's love is for the disciples and the Pharisees. God's love is for the saint and the sinner. God's love is for the pro-choice person and the pro-life person. God's love is for the Christian and the Muslim. God's love is for the heterosexual person and the homosexual person. God's love is for Republicans and Democrats. God's love is for Met fans. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll just stop right there. Um, <clears throat> and Yankee fans. All right, and, and, and Yankee fans. We're in Queens. We're in Queens. The sun shines on both. The rain falls on both. And so when we turn the cheek, it's a metaphor not just for returning evil for evil. It's a metaphor for giving surprising grace to others. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has said it better than I could. He says these words. Our behavior must not be determined by the way others treat us, but by the treatment we receive from Jesus. Our behavior must not be determined by the way others treat us, but by the treatment we receive from Jesus. We live in a counter-punching world, and to absorb the punches sometimes, as it were, metaphorically, to not retaliate can be so difficult. Last night, <clears throat> I was putting my son Nathan to bed, and uh, we were waiting for Rosie. We usually pray together before we go to bed, and I was, I was laying down in the bed next to him, and I just, I looked over him. His face was right here, and I said, Nathan, we've been talking about God a little bit, Jesus, and I said, Nathan, who loves you no matter what? He thought about it for a second. He gave the good pastor's kid's answer. He said, Jesus. I said, that's right. I said, who else? He said, mommy. <laughs> I said, who else? <clears throat> and he was so excited to say daddy that he punches me in my eye as he's saying daddy. <laughs> daddy, boom, right in my eye. Messed the whole mood up. I was just, <laughs> I had to stand up. I'm, I'm walking off. And I said, three-year-old can punch hard. I'm looking back, I'm like, who loves you no matter what you do? Um, I said, why would you do that? <laughs> why, why, why would you hit me like that? And I had to go back and said, Nathan, you just hit me. I love you anyway. I love you anyway. Thank God Rosie came in uh, to save his little behind there. So uh, <laughs> am I going to love like God loves? Or am I going to retaliate eye for eye, tooth for tooth, fracture for fracture, insult for insult, diss for diss? 
Now, for the vast majority of us, listen, this is hard, hard, hard work. And for the vast majority of us, we will most likely not be literally slapped in the face this week. If, however, you find yourself in an abusive relationship, you don't deserve that kind of treatment. And you need help. And uh, I was looking at just the, there's the, the, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, that if you need help, you don't, you're made in the image of God. You don't deserve that. And whether it's you calling this number, or whether you're call, talking to a pastor, or whether you're uh, inviting a friend into it, you're made in the image of God. You don't deserve that. And so although we might not get slapped, from time to time we get mistreated insulted, disrespected, hurt, embarrassed by another person. And in these moments, we're called to follow Jesus. But to follow Jesus in this way is more than just willpower. It means a reframing of our mind because we're so indoctrinated by the world system of counterpunching and retaliation. It's in our bones deep. And so we need a new framework. How do we live? Let me just offer, a, 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 how do we get a new frame? How do we do this? How do we live this? It requires us not just to pray hard. It requires us to see differently. And I just want to uh, mention a couple of things here. To, to, to live this kind of turn the other cheek message requires us to see a few things. Number one, it requires us to see that the person who refuses to play the retaliation game is always more powerful than the person who does. Always more powerful than the person who does. And we need to reframe it. Who's the true powerful one? The person who refuses to play the game, the retaliation game. To live this kind of way requires us to see that every time you refuse to participate in retaliation, you're stripping the powers of Satan, sin, and death in our world. You're stripping it. You're stripping the demonic powers that have damaged your marriage, that have damaged your home, that have damaged your workplace that have damaged the church. You're saying we are stripping the powers by refusing to participate in the ways of the powers. And every time you participate, you are stripping Satan's power, stripping the powers of sin, stripping the powers of death. How do we live this? Well, it requires us to see that God ultimately vindicates the person who refuses to play the retaliation game. This is why we believe in the resurrection. Not just because Jesus came back to life and a corpse is now living. It's God's way of saying Jesus has chosen to live in the way of the Father. He refused to play the retaliation game and now I am vindicating my son. I'm raising him from the dead. I'm saying, son, because you've decided to live in this way, I am vindicating you. I am justifying you. And God will vindicate the person who refuses to play the retaliation game. This is why we believe in the new age to come, in the new heavens and the new earth. You say, Rich, what about someone who died? I believe in a God who vindicates, the God of the resurrection, the God who will bring justice to the earth, the God who justifies. And it requires, how do we live this? It means that it takes a deep life of abiding in Christ to become this kind of person. You don't become this kind of person by visiting church once in a while and never communing with Jesus. You never become, you become this kind of person by soaking yourself in the presence of God. You become this kind of person by allowing the words of Scripture and the words of Jesus to so transform your social imagination. You become this kind of person when you allow yourself to be surrounded by community with people who are not going to lead you in that way of retaliation, but are going to lead you in the way of peacemaking. You become that kind of person when you're allowing space for silence and solitude and for the word of God to deeply penetrate the deepest parts of your soul. It's impossible to do this without a deep life of abiding in God. And so what does this look like? When you're abiding in God, when you are, when you, when you are living in the presence of God, allowing the words of Scripture, it doesn't mean that you won't feel the urge to retaliate. To, to feel the urge to retaliate is to be human. But not to retaliate is to be like God. And this week, you know how, you, do you know how it is? When, you, when you've been in the presence of God, you know what it's like that you, you've, not to retaliate? When someone criticizes you on social media, instead of insulting them back, maybe you ask them, tell me more about your perspective. <laughs> You're saying, yeah, right, Rich. 
Tell me more about that. And, and as a side note, we must discern the difference between a legitimate slap on the cheek and our egos being wounded. Because there's a lot of over-offended people <laughs> that live in our world. And you disagree with them just a little bit. And they say, you just slapped me in the face. No, I just disagreed with you a little bit there. And so discerning the difference between truly a slap on the cheek and your ego being wounded is the work of discernment. Listen, so, sometimes it means that when you're driving this week, someone cuts you off. <laughs> that you don't chase them down to cut them back off. The other day I was, I was driving, just having a good time. Someone just cut me right off. And I did a little beep, beep. Like, don't do that. Beep, beep. The person lowers the window. I'm behind. And the person just throws up a finger. It wasn't the thumbs up sign. It wasn't the thumbs up. It was just like <laughs> everything inside of me. I, I, I was triggered. <laughs> triggered. I want to know. No, no, I want to I drive by this person. And, and I, and I, I, and I, amen, amen. I'm already back in the flesh. I'm already back in the flesh. And I'm thinking about this, turn the other cheek. Lord, why, why would you test me like this, Lord? Why would you test me like this? And I remember he turned the other cheek and, and I just, he probably didn't see it. I just lowered the window and I just, I just put my thumbs up. Just, oh, bless him, Lord. Bless him, Lord. Just bless him. <laughs> By turning the other cheek, we become aware of the ways we escalate issues. And what does it mean to turn? It means we become more aware that we are prone to escalating issues. My children are always screaming in the house. And you know how I try to get them to stop screaming? By screaming. <laughs> why are you always screaming? Children, why are you always? I'm escalating it. I'm escalating it. I'm perpetuating it. And they're looking at me like, <laughs> I learned it from you. You know, just like, <laughs> why are you always screaming? And so it, to turn the other cheek means that, that we are mindful of the ways that we escalate, that we perpetuate, that we keep it going. Now, if you think you can do any of this in your own strength, you're wrong. But if you belong to Jesus and Jesus' his spirit is inside of you, you have more power than you think. And let me end with this here. What I love most about this passage and what Jesus is saying is that Jesus reminds us that God is not a counter-punching God. God is not a God of retaliation. God is not a God of eye for eye, as Jesus reveals him. God is a God of mercy and compassion. First Peter says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't play the retaliation game? Aren't you glad that when you don't have a life of God with prayer and you've missed church, Jesus doesn't take it out on you? Aren't you glad that when you've sinned and messed up your life, he doesn't take it out on you? We don't serve a counterpunching God. We serve a God who absorbs the sin, takes it on his body, and gives us back grace, and gives us back compassion, and gives us back mercy. This is the God that Jesus reveals. By his wounds, we are healed. He wasn't wounded and said, now I'm going to wound you some more. He absorbs it on his body and says, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they are doing. And this is the invitation for those of us who follow him today. Let's pray together. I want you to think for a moment of the person that you want to counterpunch. And maybe it's a literal counterpunch or figurative, metaphorical counterpunch. And I'm not saying today that you have to force it. I got, I got to, it's, it's you saying, Lord, in my own strength, I cannot love this person the way you call me to love. I just want to confess that. 
I'm poor in spirit. But Lord, give me the grace to open myself up to you who can love through me. Sometimes that's all we can do. Lord, would you love through me? And sometimes it takes days and weeks and months. But Lord, that should be our posture. Would you love through me? Left to my own devices, I can't do it. Lord, love through me. And I imagine today you came in and with anger and resentment, and it is a very human thing to want to retaliate. But it's a, it's a divine thing to love. Lord Jesus, may we be people marked by your love. And Lord, I ask that you would give us the grace and the mercy to look more like you. May we refuse the powerful urge to retaliate this week, whether it's on social media, at our workplace, in our home, in our parenting, in our marriage, with our roommate. Lord, may we be people who learn how to bless and pray. May we be people marked by your love. We sing to you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen.